guys. Good morning, and uh, welcome to January's episode of Coffee Kids and Sports Medicine. Uh, as always, please uh, please make sure to log in so you can claim your CME credits. Um, at the end of the talk, if you have any questions or comments you'd like to make, please uh, feel free to submit them in one of these three manners. We have the text option, our email, uh, as well as uh, those of you logged in on YouTube, you can do the live chat version as well. Uh, today's topic is going to be a, a great talk. We're really excited about it. We have Dr. Jacob Jones, who is one of our pediatric sports medicine physicians here at Texas Scottish Rite in Frisco. Uh, Dr. Jones uh, you know, attended his medical, I'm sorry, his, his undergraduate at BYU uh, with a degree in neuroscience, followed by medical school at uh, Missouri University, and then his pediatric residence here at UT Southwestern. Uh, at that point, he went on and completed two fellowships at uh, Boston Children's, one with pediatric sports medicine and the other one with pediatric sports medicine musculoskeletal ultrasound, which is such a great um, and, and a unique talent that he has and something we really uh, have, have had lots of benefits from just discussion and learning from him here on this campus. It's something that's unique to the community we're able to, to offer and, and really uh, excited about having that resource here at, UT, or at um, Scottish Rite. So this morning, he's going to be talking to us about uh, hot topics in sports medicine. It's a great topic. Uh, talk goes through a lot of um, things that you guys will see, and, and hopefully you get a lot out of this, this talk and this lecture. Thank you. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me this morning. Excited to talk about this topic. So here's the objectives. You can see here, we're just going to talk about some common things we see in uh, pediatric sports medicine, and I have no disclosures relevant to this topic. All right, so the first question is going to be, does this apply to me? Do I actually need to listen to this or not? Well, if you're any type of provider, uh, physician, athletic trainer, physical therapist, chances are you're going to see this. If you work in the ER, it's coming to an ER near you. I promise you that. If you're an advanced uh, practice provider, depending upon where you work, you're likely going to see this as well. And even if you're not in a specific pediatric or sports medicine field, people know that you're in the healthcare field, right? And so they're going to ask you, hey, I have a kid that has this problem. What do you think about this? And even if you're not in healthcare, you're going to have some neighbor or you may have kids of your own who play sports because they live in North Texas, right? So there is some applicability to, to each of you this morning. All right. So just a little background. There's a lot of kids that play sports. All right. And about half of the injuries we see are due to overuse. All right. And a lot of these kids, they have to get medical treatment for their injuries. And of all the sports injuries that exist, both kids and adults, we know that a big portion of them actually happen in kids. Now, what are some other risk factors apart from kids playing sports? Well, the pandemic itself is a risk factor, right? When we first got into the pandemic, sports shut down. These are profitable institutions, and there was a period of time when they were not making any money, right? They were not reaching their profits. And so as soon as things opened back up, they wanted to obtain or they want to get their profits back in line. And so they started cramming in all of these sports, all these tournaments, all these events, right? And so all these kids are playing sports, and maybe even more sports than what they were playing before because they didn't have it for a period of time. Well, do you know the actual monetary value of the youth sports industry? $19.2 billion. All right. Well, how does that compare to other things? What about the NFL? Professional football, $15.2 billion. What about professional basketball? $8.6 billion. And what about baseball? $3.6 billion. All right. And once research market... Um, Market research company estimated that it's going to grow to $77 billion by 2026, all right? So there's a lot of money in this, which can sometimes push kids a little bit more than maybe what is needed, which can lead to injuries. So let's talk about some of these injuries, some of these hot topics. Well, first is sport-related concussion. This is a very hot topic here. So what is a concussion? Well, you have a direct blow to the head, neck, face area, and it causes a force that goes through the head, okay? And then that leads to these rapid onset of symptoms that develop usually over minutes to hours. The symptoms are more functional related and not structural related. And we know that there's a wide variety of symptoms that can occur from a concussion. 
And a concussion is actually a diagnosis of exclusion. We know it's not due to any other causes. Well, what actually happens in the brain, right? This is a functional issue, not a structural issue. So this is a drawing of a neuron. And this is how neurons usually are. You have potassium inside, calcium, and sodium outside. Well, what happens is the potassium goes outside, the calcium and sodium go inside the cell. You get increased amount of glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, while the neuron is already depressed. And so the body tries to restore homeostasis or tries to put things back where they belong. And so it brings in these pumps to kind of pump things out and pump things in, but those pumps take energy, right? But the blood flow to the brain gets dysregulated during this time. And so you get this energy crisis, right? All these things happen at once. And then the actual injury can cause some injury to the actual axons, all right? And so all these can combine, create this wide breadth of symptoms that we see with concussions. So let's go through some of the details or some of the things we know about concussions. Well, what two sports have the highest rate of concussion? You can probably guess the first one, boys tackle football. And that shows those numbers there. That's how many concussions per athletic event, AE as athletic event. So anytime someone plays one, one kid plays one sport, whether that's a practice or game, that's considered an athletic event, all right? Well, number two, you may not know, but it's actually female soccer. You see a lot of concussions in female soccer. Well, what are the most common symptoms? I think you can probably guess some of these. Headache, dizziness, difficulty concentrating, confusion. But loss of consciousness, actually getting knocked out per se, actually doesn't occur that frequently in sport-related concussion. A big question we get when these kids come in, you know, when can my kid get back? Or when are they gonna get better, right? Well. We don't always know, but the statistics have shown us that 70 to 90% of kids recover from their concussion between one and four weeks. We don't say it's a prolonged concussion until after that four week mark. All right, well, then parents wanna know, well, how do I know if my child's likely gonna have prolonged symptoms, right? We wanna get them back, they wanna get back, they wanna get better. Well, some risk factors that we know of including a high symptom load. So if when they come to you and they say, yeah, I've got a really bad headache, I've got dizziness, difficulty concentrating, and they're all really bad, there's a chance that their symptoms could last longer than average. If they've had a loss of consciousness, um, females are more likely to have prolonged symptoms. The teenage years, right? There's already enough stuff going on in the teenage years. Might as well add this to it as well. And then if there's a history of anxiety or depression. All right. Another question we often get that uh, considered a hot topic is, well, should my child get a head CT after their concussion? There's a really nice calculator out there. There's a calculator you can call these rules called the PCARN criteria. Okay. And what we do as providers is we go through this and based upon if they check these certain boxes, that helps us determine if they actually need a head CT or if they don't. And this here, you can see, uh, if you're not familiar with it, the, the kind of boxes we go through, if they have altered mental status, uh, GCS is just what their overall consciousness is. We want it to be at a normal level, or if they've got signs of basal or skull fracture, vomiting. So we go through this and that helps us determine, yes, they need a head CT or no, they, they shouldn't need a head CT, all right? A question we often get in clinic is parents come in and say, well, my kid needs a head CT, right? They've had this concussion. This study done is actually really helpful to often steer parents away from telling them that we don't need to get a head CT. Because if it's already six hours after the injury and the patient has not had any deterioration in consciousness, so they have normal consciousness, their loss of, um, and what they, what they did in this study is if they made sure there was loss of consciousness less than one minute after the injury and their consciousness is normal at the time um, and their neurological exam was normal, those kids that got CT, do you know what percent actually had significant findings on their head CT? 0.03%, okay? 
And so when I see kids and they're like, oh, you're six hours after, I know you're feeling bad, but you meet all these criteria, guess what? I can reassure the parents, I can use this data, these numbers and say, you do not need a head CT, right? This is what the studies have shown us. Well, what happens if a kid actually does return to play while they have a concussion? Well, one thing is that they can have worse symptoms or longer recovery, so they can have prolonged symptoms, right? You could just lengthen things out a little bit. If you're not thinking clearly or you're not kind of functioning properly, you can get an additional injury, right? You can stumble, you can't protect yourself, you can get hit on the other side, you can blow out your knee, lots of things that can occur. And then although, although this idea is controversial, it's something to be aware of is the second impact injury, which can be uh, very serious and can cause uh, significant morbidity and even mortality. All right, well, what about school? Well, after a one or two day break from school, we like to get kids back to school. We give them adjustments uh, as needed because they obviously, or oftentimes can't do everything in school. These adjustments include permission to take breaks. So if your symptoms are really bad, hey, you can take a break, go to the training room, go to the nurse, nurse's office. Hopefully that headache or that dizziness you're having will calm down a little bit. Reduce workload as needed. Eliminate unnecessary work is helpful as well. And if you need to give them sunglasses because you know, they're sensitive to the, uh, to the light or sensitive to the sound, you can give them some earplugs as well. All right. So the, the general principle with Treating concussions is what I call the Goldilocks principle, right? If you remember Goldilocks and the three bears didn't like things too hot, not too cold, just right. Same idea with concussions. You don't want to give them too much to do, but also if you just lock them in a dark room, that's not going to be helpful either, all right? So you want it just right. And so that's the idea of you restore normalcy with adjustments as needed, okay? Now, in, in medicine, we love to prevent things from happening, right? So how can you prevent concussions from happening? Well, you're going to see a lot of industry and a lot of people say, hey, buy this $1,000 helmet or this mouthpiece that has this microchip in it, and that's going to help prevent concussion. Well, of all of these things that we see here, the only thing that we know that can actually prevent concussion is strengthening your neck, all right? So that's what I tell people after they recover, say, hey, save your money. If you wanna help prevent, other than changing your sport, you know, get that neck nice and strong and that can help prevent concussions, all right? Now, in the state of Texas, who can release a young athlete to begin return to play progression? This is important to know, this is state law, okay? The only person that can do that is a physician, okay? So that's important to know. All right, so that's enough about the hot topic of concussions. Let's go a little bit into musculoskeletal injuries. So just here are some risk factors for overuse injuries in, uh, in youth. And you can see a lot of these and people are probably nodding their head and like, yep, I can see how that can cause overuse injuries in youth. We're gonna talk about, about just a couple of one. This is from a study here. And this graph, um, the y-axis is bone mineral content velocity, so how fast the bone is actually turning over. And the x-axis is the age. And you can just see the peak, right? So when is the bone turning over the most, both in females and in males? It's in their teenage years. And you can imagine, if the bone is turning over frequently, they're gonna be at risk for injuries. Well, on top of the bone turnover, you also have these growth areas in youth, right? So one we know about is the growth plate, which is called the physis. And you can see a picture of the physis there on the right. And then the other one is the apophysis. And that's where a, a muscle tendon unit attaches to the bone. And so both of these areas are susceptible to injury. And this image just shows you kind of the relationship between the physis and the apophysis. Oftentimes they're, they're close or right next to each other. So let's go through a couple of examples of some of these injuries that we see frequently. So here's a 12 year old gymnast, uh, which we have a lot of in North Texas with left greater than right wrist pain after a weekend meet. You can see on these x-rays or that red arrow, that physis looks irregular to me, right? It's not crisp and clean. You can see what we call some increased sclerosis in that area. 
And there's even a little bit on the right side as well. So this young gymnast has what we call gymnast wrist. Well, what is gymnast wrist? It's just an overuse injury that we see in competitive gymnasts. Um, it can cause problems, and oftentimes we'll see some abnormalities on the radiographs, which we, sh we saw before. And it, um, it occurs very frequently. We see this often in our gymnasts. So what do we do to treat it? Well, we have to rest from putting weight, the constant pounding on their wrists until, we usually say, until their symptoms are gone. And then to hopefully help prevent recurrence, we build up some strength maybe improve their mechanics. We, we rely a lot on the physical therapist to help us out with this. Now, what about bracing? There's questionable evidence whether bracing really makes a difference in the prevention and treatment of this or not. All right, here's another case. So we have a 13-year-old male baseball player with worsening right shoulder pain. And he's tender right over that lateral shoulder. So you get these x-rays, we got the, the right shoulder, and then we got the comparison view on the left side. You can see right where that arrow points, it's just a little bit wider compared to the other side. And their exam is also focally tender over that area. So what do they have? This patient has little leaked shoulder. So it occurs in our teenage years, usually early teenage years, just from the constant distraction and torsion on that growth plate area, right? It's susceptible to injury. So what do we do? Well, you need to rest from throwing, let your symptoms get better, let that growth plate heal. And then once again, after it heals and they're feeling better, we'll do some rehab, improve some strength and flexibility, work on some mechanics if needed, get the help of our physical therapist with this. And then something we can do to helpfully help prevent this is talk about, hey, don't overdo it. Don't pitch too much. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Well, what about the same player has some pain in their elbow? There is no acute injury, just this gradual onset of some medial elbow pain. So we got our right elbow x-ray. We compare it to the left side here. And you can see that, that uh, growth plate on the medial elbow right there is a little bit wide compared to the left side. And they're point tender over that area as well. So what is this? Well, this is little league elbow, all right? And so what do we do? Treatment's relatively the same. We, we follow the same principles with treatment. All right, well, what if it's not a gradual onset of pain? What if they threw and they felt a pop? So more of an acute, or sometimes it can be acute on chronic. Yeah, it was hurting, and then I threw and felt, oh, I felt a pop. I did something to my elbow there. Well, you can see here that um, epiconda actually popped off, it avulsed off, right? So this is an actual fracture of, of the elbow here. So this will be different than how we treat the other thing. That You see how that piece of bone kind of came off there. This is likely going to need um, surgery to put that back in to help restore their normal function, all right? So USA Baseball, in conjunction with the Major League Baseball, came out with these pitch count guidelines. And this is just, just an example of the pitch counts. You know, it's based upon age and how much they're pit pitching and how frequently they're pitching. But we encourage our throwers to follow these guidelines to help reduce the risk of injury. And if they come in for injury, this is what we, what we give them. We have a handout that has this information on it. We give it to them, encourage them to follow it. To, so hopefully we don't see them uh, back in clinic with similar problems. All right, what about this? So, we're back to a gymnast here. This has four months of chronic elbow pain. And we get this x-ray of their elbow. This is a little bit more subtle and it's okay if you need to rely on the help of your radiologist to identify this, but there's just a little, think about, we use the word lucency, but just a little abnormality, a little discoloration right there. Well, what is this? This is an osteochondritis dissecans lesion. So you may know that, yeah, these frequently occur in the knee, but they occur in the elbow as well in our upper extremity athletes. So what are we gonna to do to treat these? Well, we say, hey, you need to rest from your activities for now. We need to get some more information. And so these uh, young athletes are gonna get an MRI to really see, uh, to see that lesion and to further characterize it, which will help us determine how we're gonna treat that. All right, so let's go down to the knee. 
So we have a 13 year old playing basketball. They were going in for uh, what they thought they were gonna do. They were gonna dunk it, but they're 13, so they actually can't dunk it. But that's what they were thinking they were gonna do. But the knee gave out when they were pivoting. Felt a pop, and then you see them either right there on the court or in clinic the next day. And you look at their knee, and if you can kind of see here, that right knee, it just has some increased fullness right there compared to the left knee. You, you lose the definition of the patella, and there's kind of some swelling that's mostly above uh, the kneecap there. And so this patient has a knee effusion, so the swelling is inside the knee joint. And I understand some of you may not be comfortable with, or may not be confident with, with your exam here, um, but for this particular person, we do a Lachman test here, which we're demonstrating as we grab the tibia, and you can see it translates or it moves anterior, moves forward more than what we'd expect it to do, okay? And so this gives us an idea of, of what is going on with this patient, what happened with this acute injury. Now, one thing that can hopefully help um, improve your confidence with diagnosing these knee injuries is being able to identify a knee effusion on x-ray. Yes, you can see it on exam, which we saw, but to confirm what you're thinking on your exam is being able to identify it on the x-ray. So here, on the right side of the screen, I'm gonna outline what the knee effusion is. So you can see that red line right there. You can see how that differs compared to the x-ray on the left. So just that increased whiteness there, that's the fluid that's inside the joint. That's the knee effusion there, okay? So here's another example. So the x-ray on the left, if you look just right above that patella between that area and the femur, you can see that whiteness there, right? And so that's the swelling, that's knee effusion. Where if you go to the other x-ray, it's a little bit darker there, right? And so that's the one on the right side is a normal uh, knee x-ray. There's no effusion in there, okay? And so our young athlete toward the ACL maybe has a meniscal tear as well. So they're gonna get an MRI to further evaluate that. And so if you see these in the ER, in your office, wherever, you can just put them on crutches and have them follow up with us, okay? So in the setting where you get or you identify a knee effusion or you see it on the x-ray and there's no fracture, it can really help you know, even if you're not confident in your exam, what the possible, what the possibilities are, all right? Some studies, has, has, some studies have helped us out with this. So if they're the younger teenagers, it's most likely to be a patellar dislocation, but could also be an ACL tear, an isolated meniscal tear. The older teenagers, it's more likely ACL tear, and then patellar dislocation, and then isolated meniscal tear. So why this may be important for you is, hey, if they have an effusion and there's no fracture in there, it's gonna be one of these. So you can either get an MRI or you can send them to sports, you can send them to us, and we're likely gonna get an MRI to evaluate for one of these three things, all right? All right, here's another example. So you're at your 13-year-old soccer game. Someone goes down with an injury. There's panic. There's no athletic trainer. You say, hey, you're a nurse, right? Or you're a provider. Come hurry, there's a lot of pain. Come, come take a look at this kid. And you go and you look at the kid, and what do you see there? The kneecap is hanging out to the side there. And that's why everyone's panicking. So first thing is, don't panic about this, right? So this person has a patellar dislocation. So what can you do? You can reduce the patella. How do you do that? Straighten out the knee, okay? So just like this picture here, just do your best to straighten it out if you need to distract them. I know it's always hard to calm the kids down in this situation. Maybe harder to calm the parents down than the actual kid, but just straighten the knee. If you need to give a little kind of gentle guidance to that patella to put it back in the middle, that's okay. But the less force, the better, okay? Then afterwards, you know, you can put them in a knee brace, immobilizer, crutches, and have them follow up with sports medicine. All right. Well, let's move to chronic issues. So here's an x-ray here. This person comes in with chronic pain right over the tibial tubercle, right? So that's the upper part of the tibia. There's no swelling and they can still 
use their knee, straighten it out just fine. You get these x-rays and you see that swelling there where that arrow's pointing to. Well, you may know this already, this is hodgkin slaughter disease, right? And so what do we typically do? Well, we do some therapy, work on some stretches. You can give them some knee straps, which will take some of the tension off of that area, eyes, NSAIDs, and say, hey, you can do activity as you tolerate it. People may ask, well, what does that mean? And so I'll say, well, you need to rest if, if the pain's bad, right? Or as long as the pain, you know, if the kid wants to do, still play as much as they can, I say, as long as it's not altering the way he or she is running, and they're still having fun, they're not thinking about their pain the entire time, it's okay to still play, all right? Well, what if those don't work? Those work most of the time, but what if they don't? What if they're still having pain that's keeping them from playing? Well, this is a study that was done in 2011 where they did these hyperosmolar dextrose injections right into the area. So they put sugar water right into that area. I know it sounds a little silly. Um, it's a pretty good study. It's a randomized control trial and it actually helped decrease their pain and they were able to get back and, and play sports. And this is an image from the paper where it shows where they injected that medicine into, right into that tibial tubercle. And so we, we do this here. I've done it about 10 times over the past year. And all the patients we've had have, uh, have had good results from it as well. All right, so here's another chronic knee issue here. So 14 year old, chronic knee pain, you get x-rays and you may be able to identify there, as you can see by the red arrow, something looks irregular, something looks off. What's that kind of crack through the bone? Well, these people don't have injury. They often describe kind of a deep, nonspecific, achy knee pain. Well, this is an osteochondritis dissecans lesion, all right? And so treatment is gonna depend, once again, upon what we see with the MRI. That's gonna help us determine what to do. So if you see this, just send it over to us. You know, we can, uh, we'll take care of it from there. We're gonna get an MRI to get some further information about this. Well, what is an OCD or osteochondritis discans lesion? It's an injury to the cartilage and bone. We don't know exactly why it happens, all right? If you don't treat it, it could lead to premature arthritis, right? We don't want that. No one wants that, but we don't want that in our kids for sure. And it's commonly seen in the teenage years and more often in males than females. One thing to, to note is, you know, these can occur in different parts of the, the knee, but the most common area is on the condyles. And here's an example of a simple AP x-ray of someone who had an OCD lesion. And you may look at the x-ray and say, that looks pretty normal, nothing obvious there. But if you get this additional x-ray view called the tunnel view or the notch view, it will actually, it may help you see it a little bit better. So you, you don't see it very well in the AP view, but when you get the tunnel notch view, you can see, hey, that looks irregular, that looks off there. And this is just a model that shows you the difference between an AP and a tunnel view. So there's a little orange marker there and on the left side, on the AP view, you can't see it very well, but if you get the x-ray with their knee just a little bit more flexed, you see how it reveals where that potential OCD could be. Um, so you can see it a little bit more easily. All right, well, just a few more things here. So we have a 12 year old without an acute injury, just some pain, and they can often localize it to the base of the fifth metatarsal, so, so the side of the foot. All right, and you get this x-ray and you're gonna think, oh my goodness, they have a fracture there. But this is actually not a fracture here. This is another, um, what we call apophysitis injury, okay? So where a muscle attaches to the bone, just like osgood schlatter uh, disease, you get a little irritation of that growth area there. And how we know this is not a fracture is because the line is parallel to the metatarsal there, okay? So you can see how that line is parallel to the fifth metatarsal there. So we call this Islin's apophysitis. And you treat it similar to how you treat, you know, osgood slaughter disease, other apophysitis. Relative rest, rehab, activity is tolerated, they need some NSAIDs, you can do that as well, okay? So here's an example of an actual fracture here. So you see how that line actually goes perpendicular to the metatarsal. All right, so we say, yep, that one on the left, that's a fracture, and obviously your history is probably gonna be more in line with the fracture as well. 
All right, what about back pain? So here's an adolescent that's had three months of back pain. It may be acute, chronic, sometimes acute on chronic, sometimes comes and goes a little bit. There's no red flag symptoms, which are listed here. And they've got pain with extension. So this is a picture of a patient extending their back. So what could it be? Well, it could be several things, but one thing that we're always keeping our eye out in sports medicine um, is what I'll show you. But you get x-rays, and the x-ray looks normal, right? And so you think, well, what else could it be? You get an MRI, and the MRI, which I'll highlight there in the arrow, shows stress within the bone, either a stress fracture or a developing stress fracture in the bone there. And so this is spondylolysis, okay? So it's an overuse injury of the spine, and it, is, it occurs frequently. So about half of the patients that come in that have pain, or half of the athletes that come in with pain whenever they extend or bend backwards are gonna have a spondylolysis, right? And even the non-athletes with low back pain, it's possible and likely that they could also have spondylolysis back there. Just due to that repetitive hyperextension, you can see that picture down on the bottom right. People like gymnasts and dancers who do a lot of this, right, over and over and over again, hours on hours every day, they're gonna develop these things and we're gonna see it, all right? And just a reminder, radiographs are often negative. Now, sometimes, um, well, not sometimes, infrequently, rarely, we'll actually see progression. If you get cracks in the bones, right, and those cracks don't heal, that bone can actually slide a little bit, but we don't see that very frequently, all right? All right, we're gonna hit just a couple of hip injuries, uh, hip and pelvis injuries, and then we'll be done, all right? So in comes an 11-year-old with chronic right buttock pain, and there's no injury there. You get x-rays, which you see here, here's an AP view of the pelvis, and this is subtle, but if you look carefully there, you see just, you see how the contour of that right ischium is just a little bit irregular compared to the left side, and it correlates with your physical exam and the history as well. And then you can compare it to the other side, and you see the other side has that nice contour, doesn't look, doesn't look irregular. Well, here's another apophysitis of the right ischium, okay? I'll give you another example here. So this person is complaining of left hip pain and they are point tender right over the top part of the pelvis, right? You can reproduce their pain by pushing right over that, that, that bone there, all right? And it bothers them when they're running, jumping, doing other kind of dynamic or ballistic activities. Well, this is another apophysitis of the pelvis, just in a different location. All right, well, how do we treat this one? How do we treat the last one? Well, treat with relative rest, right? And so what does that mean? I often say, avoid unnecessary aggravating activities. Uh, of course, if they've been having it for a while or it's really inhibiting them, then you may be a little bit more strict on what you recommend with rest. But rehab is important. Work on some flexibility, some strengthening so that you, so that the patient tugs less at that area. Um, NSAIDs often work as well. And then if those don't work, we have some other things that we can do to help treat these. Well, what if it's not chronic? What if it's more acute around the hip, around the pelvis? Well, here's another young athlete that felt a pop in the right hip and you get x-rays having a lot of pain, difficulty using their hip, and you see that arrow there, you can see they pulled off that piece of bone there. And so this is an avulsion of the lesser trochanter. Well, what are you gonna do uh, if you see this in clinic or if you suspect this? Well, just give them some crutches, you can give them some NSAIDs for some pain control, just have them rest and have them follow up with us and we can uh, kind of take it from there, help treat them. All right, here's another one. This one's a little bit more subtle there. Acute injury, but you see pulled off that little fleck of bone there. This is an avulsion at a different area of the pelvis. All right, and so when we see these in clinic, we typically, they're gonna be out for two to four months. We want things to kind of calm down. We try to get that bone to heal in there. Um, and then after we get that bone to heal in some, we'll, we'll 
get them into rehab. We're grateful for our uh, trainers and therapists who help us with this. And then as they get stronger, work on their flexibility, we'll gradually get them back into sport after that. All right. This is the last one. So oftentimes most of the avulsions around the pelvis are treated relatively the same. This one has, we sometimes we'll treat this one a little bit different. All right. So if you can see there on the x-ray, there that red arrow points to it, you see we a big piece was avulsed off of the ischium there, right? And so, yes, the person's gonna have pain, but what other symptoms may they complain of? Well, this patient may have some radiculopathy or shooting pain down that lower extremity. And the reason why, this is a, a kind of a blown up cartoon, right at the ischium, if you can see that yellow, uh, that yellow cord, that yellow tissue, that's the sciatic nerve. So right next to those hamstrings is the sciatic nerve. So if you pull off that bone there, there's a chance you could irritate that sciatic nerve, which can cause some of these symptoms. And so if you see this, make sure you get them in to see us quickly so that we can uh, you know, make sure we get them, them treated appropriately. Well, thanks so much for your time and attention. I sure appreciate it. If there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take those at this time. Yeah, it depends on the body part and what the overuse injury is. Um, but, you know, we'll take into account those factors if it's some of these ones like Seavers disease in the heel or Osgood slaughter or Islands like we talked about. Those are ones to say, yeah, a little bit of pain, no problem at all. You can keep playing. We'll do these things to kind of help you out in the meantime. There's other overuse injuries like stress fractures. Um, or sometimes overuse injuries in the elbow where we're gonna say, hey, you know, for the long-term health of things and to avoid other complications, we're gonna say, hey, let's, let's rest or relative rest, right? We still want kids to be active in some form. They can, may still be able to do some aspects of their sport, but not all aspects of the sport. And so we can help coach them a little bit on their specific case. Very good, great questions. So things I look for is, use the word chronic and recalcitrant. So if they've, it's been going on for a while, they have tried other more conservative things, including rest, rehab, bracing, particularly for the knee, the, you know, these patellar knee straps, ice, NSAIDs, tried all those things, and despite those things, they're still having pain. Oftentimes, as far as radiographs go, these uh, young athletes will have more chronic appearing changes over that tibial tubercle, okay? So that includes widening of that um, tibial tubercle apophysis, or like we saw on the, the x-ray here, they'll get these little ossicles or kind of extra bone growth there. So the, those are the main things that I look at as far as deciding if I wanna do these hyperosmolar injections or not into the area. Now, what is the mechanism? That's a great question. There's been some proposed mechanisms with, with these dextrose injections. I think the one I seem to like the most is you go by injecting this medicine in there, you almost go in and create an, a little bit of an acute injury on a chronic condition, all right? So by going in there with your needle, you do that and having this dextro solution in there kind of wakes up the body to this area. And so then that brings in more of the healing factors that your body naturally has into that area to help, um, help things improve, help things get better. But we, we don't really know the answer. That's just the proposed theory and that's the one I like the best anyway. Have you had the opportunity to try it in other sites of apophysitis other than the tibial tubercle? Um, I I haven't with hyperosmolar dextrose. I have with platelet-rich plasma and seen good results. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think one tip uh, that we've tried to simplify as pediatricians is 
how much sport to participate in. And so the recommendation we usually make is you take their age and that many, that number, you recommend they participate in no more than that many hours of their sport per week, okay? And so if they're 12 years old, I say no more than 12 hours of participation in sport per week. So that's one. Um, the other thing I recommend is they take off at least one day from their sport every week. Okay, so if they're really in, if, you know, they're already specializing in baseball, they're playing it all year round, um, say every week, you need to take off at least one day from baseball. You can still be active, still do other things, but take one day off. And then the third recommendation I would say is if you're focused on a specific sport, you need to take off at least three months from that sport every year. So only focus on that sport at most nine months out of the year. It doesn't have to be three consecutive months, but do something different. And we talk about injury prevention while still keeping the kids active and hopefully by still keeping them active, they can still be happy and get the benefits of, of sport and exercise. That's a good question. So there's, you know, the, the fear of sports specialization is the you know, born, burned out, in, um, more prone to certain injuries from doing the same thing over and over again. So what I like to say is, hey, try to wait until at least the high school years, if you can, before specializing in sport. And I like to back it up with real world examples, right? Because most of the time people hear about Tiger Woods and how he was playing golf at a young age. Most professional athletes are actually the opposite. They didn't really specialize until later in life. And so some good examples include Patrick Mahomes, right? NFL MVP, Super Bowl winning quarterback. He didn't specialize. I mean, he was a baseball player and football player, so that's a good one. Um, Roger Federer, right? He didn't even like tennis until later in life, right? And he was kind of decided getting into it and then turned out to be a great, great, uh, great tennis player. Um, so I try to pull in some of those, some of those examples. Of, hey, look at these really successful athletes. They didn't do anything until later in life. And there's, there's, there's lots of other ones. Alex Morgan for some of the female soccer players because soccer is really popular around here. She didn't specialize until later in life as well. That's a great question. You know, being a pediatrician and other primary care providers, it's never too early to do injury prevention. Right? If we can prevent things, that's, that's the best. That way the kid can stay active and continue to move forward. There's some good kind of simple, easy to understand injury, um, injury prevention programs out there that are available to people. And so any opportunity you have, whether it's in a, you know, they're coming in for the annual physical or some vaccines or anything, and you can plug some injury prevention, that's great. One good example is what we call a FIFA 11. So FIFA has come up with this program, these exercises they can do before each practice or as part of each practice, and it can help prevent significant knee injuries like ACL tears. Um, and so that's just one example of a, a good injury prevention program and get started uh, you know, as, as early as possible is what we'd recommend. So. Good question. Yeah, I think if it doesn't fit the, the typical picture, right? So if you take the example of osgood Schlatter disease, right? They'll have pain right over the tibial tubercle. Oftentimes it's bilateral and oftentimes it's associated with doing activity. So if it kind of fits that um, and they're not having any other symptoms apart from this activity related pain to that area, it may be appropriate just to wait and see and you know, if they're doing okay and things aren't worsening and and then you can continue to just uh, follow that. But if the pain turns more chronic, right? So like, okay, this is going a long time. It's still getting in the way. Then maybe you can start with some imaging, just some basic radiographs and make sure there's nothing else going on. Um, and, and then if they're still frustrated or, hey, I still think it's this, but they're still having issues, then we're happy to see any patients anytime, either at the beginning or if you other providers or healthcare professionals want to try to manage things and uh, for a while and send it to us. We're happy to see these kids at any time. So thank you.